Underrated, underappreciated, there are hordes of great RPGs out there that don't get the love they deserve. We did a video on this two months back, and now we're going to do another. Starting with Star Ocean, The Divine Force. Unironically, one of my favourite games from last year, and for good reason too. I consider Divine Force to be the best 7 out of 10 game you'll play, and that is because it has a very clear identity. I attribute this game to a 99p with Flake, which isn't so much the case anymore due to inflation, it's more like £2.50 in Flake now, but the point is, it's a treat with no bells or whistles. It's familiar, refreshing, and tasty. That's exactly what Divine Force is. It doesn't do anything to break the mould, but as an RPG, it nails the foundation of what makes this genre so enjoyable to play. In this game, you have a choice of two protagonists, Raymond, the spacefaring cargo boy who clearly pumps iron, and Leticia, the princess of a kingdom fighting to maintain their sovereignty on the planet below. Raymond is shot down and stranded upon this planet, the two meet up and go on their merry way. As is the case with a dual protagonist approach, both characters have unique story events specific to their arcs, which I think is utilised fairly well. I'm personally more a fan of a singular route recently rather than branching paths, but Divine Force handles the premise admirably. Now it's true that the game has flaws, I'm not debating that, and that's mostly tied to its budget, so there's notable shortcomings in regards to character models that aren't going to appeal to everyone, cutscenes that are a bit sudden in their transitions, and the odd sound balancing issue. But even with that, this is a return to form for Star Ocean after SO5. It actually felt like what a Star Ocean game is all about, combining both a fantasy and sci-fi setting into one cohesive whole. I really have to highlight the gameplay too, it felt great with plenty of options available to customise skill sets and play in the way I wanted. The use of Duma, this pod come backpack contraption, added yet another dimension to battle, giving opportunities to target weak points and blindside opponents. Exploration was decent as part of a semi-open world format and the characters themselves, especially Raymond and Leticia, were strong throughout most of the journey. It's a testament to how fun Divine Force was that as soon as I started playing it, I didn't put it down until I had completed my playthroughs, which took about 35 hours each. And it's nice to see that even though Divine Force didn't set the world alight upon its release, selling around 45,000 units in its first week in Japan, it at least showed try ace the love people have for the franchise, which of course culminates in re-releases like Star Ocean's second story R. Next up is Monster Hunter Stories 2 Wings of Ruin, a game that I am coincidentally still playing as of the time of recording, sitting at around the 20 hour mark. One that I wish I had picked up much earlier. Monster Hunter Stories 2 is a spin-off title from the Monster Hunter series. No prize for figuring that one out. But unlike the main titles, this plays more like a traditional RPG with turn-based combat, equipment management, and a focused story. Yet it still maintains many of the facets that makes Monster Hunter such an addicting franchise to play, like a massive array of monsters called Monsties in this game, and a noticeable sense of progression in terms of gear. And I'll get this out of the way now, no, you don't need to play the first game. I'm having an easy enough time with this one without doing so, you will too. As the descendant of the legendary rider named Red, the player character trains to follow in their grandfather's footsteps, and soon their fate is intertwined with a mysterious egg entrusted to them by the island's protector, Guardian Rafa. Now, as is common with self-insert protags, your character is mute, and communicates via gestures, facial expressions, and enthusiastic nods. Unfortunately, your substitute for speech who talks on your behalf is without question the most annoying mascot character to ever mascot, this top cat wannabe called Naviru. He's no drippy, that's for certain. Sweet, round, and fried in oil? Doesn't sound very healthy, to be honest. That's the point. If you've really never heard of donuts, how come you don't go nuts? But if you manage to get past him, you'll be welcomed into one of the most enjoyable RPGs that I'd wager quite a few people don't even know about. The land is split into semi-open style zones and you work with a host of monsties to traverse the world. These creatures mostly come from monster dens. You go in, find the egg, hatch it, and raise it as your own. And each monstie comes with their own skill sets and overmap abilities. For example, some will allow you to jump to far off platforms, while others allow you to swim in water and so on. 
one. And this is really fun. Scouring the world and seeing what creatures you can find is a great incentive to keep playing. A lot of the monster designs are unique and they each come with their own strengths and weaknesses, meaning you have to find a good balance for your team. And that becomes massively important in terms of succeeding in combat. As said before, it's turn-based, but you only control your own character. The other members mostly act on their own outside of direct commands you can give to your monster partner. But what you do get as a compromise is a sizable amount of options for your protag. You have a choice of up to three weapons that you can switch on the fly to target enemy weaknesses, skill sets tied to each weapon type, and in many cases you can also choose the body part of the monster to attack, like its legs to make it lose balance or its neck to prevent a highly damaging skill. You also have this rock, paper, scissors style of attacking split between power, speed and technical that operates as a sort of weapons triangle. For example, if you attack with speed and the enemy attacks with power, you gain the advantage and deal more damage. But enemies themselves can change their behaviour mid-fight, meaning that their patterns are consistently changing. Now as for the other fighters, you can plan around their attacks too. Before you make your move, you can see what other members of the party will do, including the enemy. If you match up your attack type with a monster, you can do a dual attack which deals heavy damage and also cancels an enemy's turn completely. And lastly, you can unite with your monster to not only recover your health but to unleash your own signature attack and every monster has their own ability so there's plenty to look out for. I wish I could talk more about Monster Hunter stories too but I want to keep this video at a respectable length so I'll leave it there. But do yourself a favour if you have a Switch or a PC, I would recommend PC by the way for performance reasons, give this game a try. Next up will be the brilliant tactical RPG that is Valkyria Chronicles, the original in this case. Created back in 2008 and then remastered for 2016, it would be a lie to say that Valkyria Chronicles was not at least recognised by review outlets when it first released. It sits at around the mid-80s on all platforms as of the time of recording and was widely praised by gaming publications to boot. It's not difficult to see why. Set during the onset of the Second European War, which evidently is influenced by the events of World War II, this title is focused around the journey of Welkin Gunther and Alicia Melchiotz as they're forced to defend their home of Brule after the Eastern Empire crosses the Gallian border to lay claim to their abundant resources of Ragnite, a mineral that is integral to the economic stability of countries on the continent. What follows are a series of battles to win back peace and security for their country. In these battles, the player has two views to combat, a bird's eye command mode and an on the ground action mode where they take control of a unit. Action mode allows the player to move the unit to a limit of action points but also allows them to switch to a target mode. This gives players an over the shoulder perspective, allowing you to aim for headshots and the like. Each character also has a specific role, like lancers who specialise in anti-tank warfare, shock troopers who bring the thunder as assault units, and snipers who pick off enemies at a distance. And though these roles are fairly similar between units, each character has their own unique potentials that they bring to the table, ensuring that there is a degree of individuality between members. As all good tactical games do as well, the environment also plays a key part in battle. Tanks can knock down walls to open new paths and snipers can move to rooftops for added range. Foliage offers soft cover to reduce the chance of being spotted and Welkin himself as commander can issue various orders for things such as artillery strikes. Valkyria Chronicles offers a very gratifying and deep tactical system and I've barely touched the surface on it. But to say its gameplay is the only highlight here would be wrong. It has some of the most beautiful artwork of the time thanks to the engine used by Sega called Canvas which allowed it to adopt this watercolour approach, a style that was intended as a natural evolution of Skies of Arcadia and Sakura Wars by the producer Ryutaro Nonaka, and was influenced by a long-running anime series called World Masterpiece Theatre. Hitoshi Sakamoto was brought on board to add his practice hand for the game's OST, and the story itself was based upon numerous historical events from World War II, with Gallia being based on the Netherlands in terms of geography. The development team also aimed to create a relatable and engaging cast that seamlessly flowed with the events of the war, creating a more personal and rich experience in terms of character development. And in many cases, it succeeded in that, so much so that the game spawned several sequels in the coming years. But alas, even with that acclaim and crossing over to the likes of manga and anime, Valkyria Chronicles as a series is so often forgotten in discussions surrounding tactical games. A stalwart individual may bring it up every now and then and will often be praised for doing so, but it's as if people react in this way because they almost forgot it themselves. 
That's a shame because the first game at least is one of the finest tactical RPGs around. Next up will be Trails, but not a mainline entry, instead it's for the Legend of Nyata Boundless Trails, a game that is by no means a part of the main canon of the series, but a very solid action RPG nonetheless, and it makes all the more sense to bring up considering the imminent Western release. Originally developed back in 2012 for the PSP, it would later be remastered for modern platforms like Nintendo Switch, PS4 and PC. The game is based around two worlds, Nyata's homeworld Remnant Island and the so-called alternate land of Lost Heaven. Now while Nyata has trails in the name and certainly has similarities like the use of Mira as a currency, it's more a successor to the lesser known Falcon release of Spy 2. It's action based, has plentiful platforming and a wide array of puzzle filled lands. Nyata himself holds an arsenal of abilities like arts, crafts and magical attacks to push through any danger he faces. Such is the pedigree of Neon Falcom as ARPG veterans, it's no wonder that Nyata feels gratifying to play, much like Ys and Tokyo Xanadu. Level designs are very strong with a clear flow that doesn't break up the pace and boss battles are a spectacle that often take up the majority of a screen, much like Ys Origin. The OST is great too, but that's not really a surprise for Sound Team JDK. I also I also personally think this is one of the nicest looking games on the PSP, it's certainly got a charming aesthetic. All in all, Nyata is often forgotten because it's not a mainline Trails game, at least not yet. But just because it's pretty much its own separate experience does not mean it can't hold its own. It's a great game, won't take too long to finish, and it's just an all around good time. Moving on is yet another action RPG, and one that was hyped massively before its release but then was quickly forgotten afterwards in Scarlet Nexus. It released in 2021 via Bandai Namco and performed fairly well when it released, sitting at an average Metacritic score of 80 across all platforms. It's another game that utilises a dual protag feature in a sci-fi setting. As soon as you start up Scarlet Nexus, you get a choice between two protagonists, those being Yuito and Kasane, who both have their own journeys weaving around one narrative. While nothing mind-blowing, and I feel that some plot points were left open intentionally for a possible sequel, Scarlet Nexus had a good story, with some really nice twists to push it along, and the differing routes provided enough questions for me to feel compelled to play the other side. The shining beacon for this game, though, mainly comes from its fast, engaging and tight combat. Yuito and Kasane are psionics, individuals who are able to use extra sensory powers. They are enlisted into the OSF with a bunch of other rookies who are tasked with defending the populace from so-called others, that are extraterrestrial monstrosities that roam the outer world. It has all the characteristics you would expect from an action RPG, standard combos, aerial abilities, dodges, but what sets Scarlet Nexus apart are the powers themselves. Each psionic who is a part of your team has their own unique ability and though you don't get direct control of the character, you at least get to utilise their abilities like pyrokinesis, electrokinesis and so on. The powers themselves often have individual importance placed upon them as certain enemies can only be countered by particular abilities. For example, sometimes you need a burst of speed to hit an enemy before they can protect themselves, while others may be covered in oil, so it makes sense to set them alight with pyrokinesis. On top of that, our two protags offer up unique play styles of their own, with Yuito preferring to get up close and personal with his sword, and the more graceful Kasane raining down hell from medium range. What results is one of the better action RPGs, at least in terms of gameplay, even those who weren't captivated by the world of Scarlet Nexus would at least concede that its combat was strong. While I wouldn't say that Scarlet Nexus completely delivered on its hype, it is one of the better action RPGs released in recent years. We're going back to traditional turn-based RPGs now with Monochrome Mobius Rights and Wrongs Forgotten. Once again a great time to bring this up since it's releasing on PS4 and PS5 very soon and is already on PC. Now Monochrome Mobius is an interesting one as it was developed for the 20th anniversary of Uta Wariru Mono, and the series as a whole is without question one of the finest long-running stories I've ever experienced, filled with humour, excellent characters and a gripping plot. Monochrome Mobius is a prequel to the events of the second game within the original trilogy, focusing on the journey of Oshtor who appears in the later games. Now I will say, the experience of playing Monochrome Mobius will differ quite significantly between those who are familiar with the series and those who are not. As a standalone, it's good, but doesn't really go beyond that. It does feel dated in parts, especially in regards to animations and character models, but it's fine. As for the game itself though, it proceeds in a manner that JRPG fans will find familiar. 
You take control of a team and proceed through a linear story participating in quests, exploring a semi-open world and taking part in turn-based combat. And for this reason, I'm confident it will appeal to fans unfamiliar with the series. It's another game in the same vein as Divine Force, the good old-fashioned RPG that does the common characteristics well, but it's certainly not the highlight of the experience. And this is where I'll bring it back to that comment earlier. Those who are familiar with Utawara Rumono as a series are likely to have a great time with this prequel. Aqua Plus were aware that this game was going to draw in those who had already played the main trilogy, and as such they've weaved this story in a way that will please those who have played those games. The story feels fulfilling because it expands on many of the points that weren't given too much of a focus in the visual novel titles, while also expanding on backstories of characters who weren't at the forefront in those games but still had important roles. It's a very interesting method of storytelling in that me as the player already knew the end result. I already knew the relationship of these characters in the main games, but I never knew how that happened. Seeing those relationships grow and eventually become what they did in the Mask games was a joy to witness firsthand. The character development was so damn good. And that's why I will say that if you plan to play Monochrome Mobius and you derive a large amount of enjoyment from the story and characters, give thought to trying out the original games too if you get the chance. Our last entry is a game that I am all too happy to bring up because it remains one of the most unique and enjoyable experiences I have had in RPGs to date, and it is for the reboot of Sakura Wars for the PS4. This revisit did fairly well, despite some core changes like a switch from strategic gameplay to action-based, averaging a score of around 73 on Metacritic. Developed and published by Sega themselves in 2019 for Japan and 2020 worldwide for PS4, it continued the main canon of the overarching story that had been on extended hiatus after the commercial failure of Sakura Wars 5 in the West. Despite its relation to the older titles though, this new iteration of Sakura Wars was designed with both veterans and new players in mind, meaning those unfamiliar with the original Saturn titles can jump in here with no issue. Players control Seijiro Kamiyama, a young officer enlisted as the new head of the so-called Flower Division, a team that protects Tokyo from the threat of demons. However, the Flower Division has seen better days, and as such it's up to Seijiro and the members of the Division to restore it to its former glory. The game itself is a hybrid, it contains elements of dating sims, visual novels and action RPGs, excelling in some areas while being mediocre in others. Sadly, it's the action-based gameplay that comes up short. It looks flashy, but it has the depth of a puddle. The story isn't anything to write home about as well, it's something you've seen many times before and is Saturday morning cartoon in execution. Serviceable, but that's about it. Don't let that dissuade you though, because Sakura Wars offers something you just cannot find in many other RPGs, and it demonstrates that through the most important aspect of its series, the dating sim element. Initially, it looks brilliant, some of the smoothest and most natural animation I've seen with plenty of personality and expression for each of the members. In terms of artwork, it had Tito Kubo at the helm for the main character design, and his style with the stellar animation combined into a very pleasing result on screen. And that was so important as a window into the personalities of the characters themselves, for Sakura Wars had one main objective. It had to make each of its heroines likeable, and it easily does that. They're distinct from each other, but charming in their own ways, and they each get their moments in the spotlight to show what they're all about. And then there's the live and interactive picture system, or LIPS for short. Seijiro will have plenty of opportunity to talk to the heroines throughout this journey, and as he talks to them, he'll build reports as their captain. The responses he can give are split into certain categories. You have timed responses, which make up the majority, some are affected by how strongly he chooses to respond, and others will see you take on a first-person view to interact with the environment. 
What's so good about this though is that Sakura Wars does not take itself seriously. It's mad funny at points. What this meant is that I often did not care about making bad choices. The end result was worth it in many cases, genuinely one of the best games to just watch in motion. When I thought it had reached its peak, it always found another way to make me laugh. And that's why I love the game so much. It is so different to many RPGs out there, but it doesn't break the mold because because of a desire to stand out, rather Sakura Wars knows what it excels at and it just so happens that not many other series can do it as well as them. That alone makes it worth anyone's time. Thank you for watching this video, if you liked it please like and subscribe for more JRPG content and consider joining my Patreon if you're interested. Peace!